Welcome to the Bigfoot Society. In this episode, I talked to Ontario Richardson, an Iowa-based Bigfoot researcher, about her current research in the state, her favorite cases, and we provide a report on last summer's Iowa Bigfoot expedition. If you have experienced something similar to what Ontario has or have more information regarding Bigfoot or other cryptids in the same area, please reach out immediately to me after this episode. Remember, your encounter could be the key to unlocking this mystery once and for all, so please don't hesitate to contact me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to a good friend, Ontario Richardson. She's with the BFRO in Iowa. She's a researcher there. And how's it going, Ontario? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. It feels like just yesterday we were going out looking for some Bigfoot at a pretty cool location. We'll talk about that later. But is there anything that you would like the listeners to to know about you as well? Or is Iowa BFRO researcher uh, pretty good? Yeah, that's pretty good. I also am with the Lowlands Bigfoot group in Iowa, which is just another kind of sampling of people. Some that are in the BFRO, some are not, but we all just work together in digging up what we can about Bigfoot here in Iowa. So I guess the first question, so listeners, so I'm based out of Iowa. I think most listeners will know that I'm based out of a little bit to the West of central Iowa, Ontario's in Iowa as well. Hence the focus on Iowa Bigfoot. But a lot of people give me grief and I'm sure you hear it a few times. There's no chance Bigfoot could be in Iowa, right? How does that even make sense that it would be in the middle of cornfields? Yeah, I get that pretty frequently as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your, what's your answer to that? What kind of things do you bring up? Yeah, I think a lot of people have a misconception about what Iowa looks like or all of Iowa looks like. I think people pretty much think it's just the flat cornfields, not a lot of trees, not a lot of parks. And they're right about a good chunk of Iowa. But along the rivers, we have really lush green belts. And the further east and northeast, you get into some pretty significant bluffs, which I've heard from a lot of people that they didn't expect to see something that looked like that in Iowa. And especially along the Mississippi and the Dubuque area. And as you get a little bit further north, you get into more of a driftless area. And I talk about that quite a bit. But what the driftless area is when the icebergs were, or the glaciers, sorry, were coming down in the last ice age, they carved out quite a bit of space and it made Iowa a little bit more flat. But there are areas that it missed. And those areas are very forested. They're very thick, have a lot of water and just as steep of limestone bluffs as you'd really see anywhere. And what you'll see if you look at the BFRO or or other reports is a lot of the Bigfoot sightings and experiences are along those rivers, green belts, along the eastern and northwestern, or sorry, northeastern sections of Iowa. Yeah, absolutely. The the driftless is such an interesting area. I've been up to the northeast a bit, not to look for Bigfoot, but before I got into it, I did go up to, I believe, the effigy mounds area up there yeah. in the northeast. Yeah. That's a pretty yeah. cool area. That's for really sure. close to Yellow River, which is, is it a really, really good oh, big, man. But Yeah, it's probably five, ten minutes south of it. Oh, snap. But yeah, that's where they filmed the Finding Bigfoot Iowa episode. Which is a great episode. Listeners, if it you is, haven't seen that episode, it's a fun one. <laughs> oh, that is a good time. And then uh, is Backbone up there as well? Yeah, on the way. That's around like the Elkater Fayetteville area, mm-hmm. and which is an, another great place for Bigfoot experiences historically and, and present day. There's just that whole corridor has a lot of really great places. Yeah, Backbone has some weird stories come out of, out of it. If if listeners mm-hmm. go back to the Rick Rellis episode, talk about is a crazy Bigfoot controlling an orb story that comes out of Backbone State Park. But have you done any any research in either of those places, a Yellow River or Backbone, Ontario? I haven't I haven't done Backbone um, around that area though. 
I've done uh, like Brushy Creek Canyon, Granis Creek, Volga. Volga is a good one that people will talk about. Um, but Yellow River, I've done a handful of things at. Um, I've been up there on my own, I don't know, early summer last year, exploring some areas that another investigator had had pointed me to, and I was just overwhelmed by how good of a spot it had the potential to be and ended up going up there early July with a couple other investigators for a two, two night, three day Bigfooting trip, um, which we didn't get a lot. Some, in, some interesting sounds on a, an overnight recorder, but nothing super, didn't give a whole lot of confirmation, but it's a good enough spot. When I work with Matt Moneymaker sometimes and he pointed me to one of his favorite areas up in Yellow River and I put a game camera up there as well. So it's one of those perches that everybody talks about where it's a very high limestone bluff. And last time I, I climbed up there, there were no other footprints going up there. So it was just not a lot of people make the, the steep climbs up the bluffs, but it overlooks the, a couple different campgrounds and then also butts up to a cornfield on top and then has one of the only bodies of water up there if something wanted to drink did not go all the way down. So a lot of opportunities for watching, which I think we all know they're pretty curious animals and a good spot to just drink and then get food, whether that's deer or grain from the fields. Man, yeah, Yellow River is on my list to to check out. Ever, so ever since I've mm-hmm. talked a lot with you, Tate, some others, and there's so many places I need I need to check out, specifically in the eastern part of the state. I just haven't gotten mm-hmm. to yet. But one that is definitely on my list is the Shemek State Forest. Mm-hmm. That's just, uh, yes. it's a very interesting area for sure. I've heard some weird stuff. I know that you are one of these researchers that you are out there all the time. Uh, have you ever had any weird stuff uh, you've experienced while you're out there uh, that you feel comfortable sharing, you know, anything that you don't want to, of course, don't. But yeah, a good handful of stuff. I um, mean, it goes into the my whole theory that, you know, we probably don't have quite as many Bigfoot as someone like, I don't know, Texas or Minnesota would have. But we have smaller areas and when they are here, I think they're a lot easier to find, which I think explains why I've had a decent amount of stuff. Let's see, last winter, I had started looking at a semi-small state county park area up about two minutes from where I was living. And it's only about 900 acres or so, but like a lot of the other areas I was talking about, it connects via the Wapsie River to much larger green belts and to a lot of other areas. And I feel pretty comfortable thinking that they probably move up and down. Uh, but what I had that day was I I was early February, I think, and the snow had just started to melt. And so I figured it'd be a good day for to find any tracks, if there were any, because the mud was starting to show. And so I started in, I was really the only person in the park and I had stopped a little bit into the trail, just wanted to listen to what was around me so I could figure out what what other animals, what other birds I was sharing the space with. And I, after about, I don't know, a minute and a half or so, I heard what sounded like a Louisville slugger hit a tree off to my right to the north, off trail. And then, I don't know, about... 10, 15 seconds later, something answered that knock to the south side of the trail, which took me by major surprise because that was one of the first times I had been out solely for the purpose of Bigfooting. And I was like, man, I don't think this is supposed to happen so easily. And then I, I had worked that trail and I was working over a service road and back down into a little valley and we're walking up the hill there and saw some snow had been disturbed and there was dirt showing and it looked like something had been walking up the hill and pressed its toes into the embankment and then kept going up. Well, I ended up casting it and it had five toes, which is really interesting. And while I was casting that, either a tree was pushed down or a tree broke, but it was really coincidental that all these these things were happening 
on the same half an hour or so off to my right, which was really fascinating. And I didn't have much more there in the rest of the year because the activity in the park picks up quite a bit when it starts getting warm out. But after that, just this last couple of months ago in December, I had been walking along the Wapsi because I figured if something was going to be in there, it would be going down to the riverbank at some point. So I'd gone off trail and I was just sliding down hills, trying to figure out where the low accessible areas to the riverbanks were. And I had found a good spot and didn't see any footprints or anything next to the water. So I had started just walking back towards an embankment that goes very steep up to a service road that the park maintenance trucks use. And as I was pulling myself up with the trees, I noticed four holes poked in the ground. And I was like, what's odd? And I usually, when I see something that might be something, I'll spend the extra 20 seconds and figure out if it is or not. And so I started brushing the leaves away from it and uncovered what looked like a palm impression under the where the holes were and then a thumb to the left that was just pushed into the ground and I'd, I'd measured it and it was about 10 inches wide total with about a six inch palm if that's what it is which is really interesting so I did a 3d scan of that before I casted it and casted that or casted that afterwards I was ironically was just in that park earlier today and I work in that same area and I just haven't been able to find anything else. But, it, you know, it, it's suspicious. There's been, I haven't ever seen anything there, but it's just a conglomeration of a lot of different things that we think Bigfoot do that were all happening in the same area, which is really interesting, I think. But other than that, down, we were talking about Shimmick a little bit. It's a great park, and it it's right along the Des Moines River, I think is what it's called, which is a tributary of the Mississippi. And I was down there with some investigators and some public people, and we had been driving in two different vehicles trying to find our way to a service road entrance, a service road entrance that led to uh, a trail. And we, I was in the first car and we had pulled in and we had the mistake of having our windows up. So we couldn't hear what was going on around us. We pulled in and it wasn't the road we were looking for. So the driver just got, was getting annoyed and pulled into the turnaround, whipped around and pulled out. Well, the other vehicle had followed us in and they had their windows down. And right when we had pulled out to get back on the highway, there were two really distinct knocks as we were leaving that they heard. And once we had parked to try to figure out where we were going, we heard from the other vehicle that they hadn't heard that. And so we pretty quickly turned around and spent the rest of the evening there. And it's one of the few places I've heard my first whoops, which was really interesting. Uh, And just a handful of just odd stuff that all the different groups experienced there. And I wish it was a little closer because it'd be a great spot to work. Shimmick was great. It's on my list. It's multiple hours. We got the Outback now. It's go time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, It's like a two hour (laughs) drive for us. Oh, that's nice. We need to spend some more time down there. But there's a lot of good old railroad cuts in the trees that I've always wanted to walk in. And you know, the unfortunate, I think we were there in May, but it was probably one of the tick, tickiest places mm. I've ever been, which took away from it a bit, but have that big footing. True. The thing that one of the things I really like about you is you're in the BFRO and you're really taking it seriously. The fact where you are, I know you're constantly contacting people that are submitting reports mm-hmm. for the state of Iowa and other states too. Have there been any favorite reports that you can maybe share some about? Yeah, there's a good handful of ones, specifically in Iowa. I've done, the first one was is really one of my favorites. And it was this elderly woman. She had made this report, it might have been a few years ago, but unfortunately there just wasn't a lot of active investigators for Iowa. 
at that time. So a lot of good reports were just falling by the wayside. So I had started making my way through <clears throat> the list to get caught up on those. And I called this woman and from the Dubuque area. And off the bat, she was very confused about who I was and why I was calling her about Bigfoot. And I, I try not to prompt um, people too much, but I had said, you had made a report a couple years ago about a strange experience you had as a counselor at a Girl Scout camp. And she snapped to knowing exactly what I was talking about and just being very clear minded in an instant, which really left an impression on me of the impact of her experience it had on her. But it was in the late 50s. I think, and fortunately, Dubuque has not changed a lot since then, but she was working at a Girl Scout camp as a counselor, and one night, she had seen a really big, kind of shadowy figure standing next to one of the buildings on the property, and she had thought it was the husband of the camp director, so the next day, she had asked why he was standing out there so late and he was, I wasn't. And then the rest of the time she was there, she was hearing and her, the, cam- the campers, the other counselors were all hearing once everyone, everybody went to bed, something walking through camp and pausing by the tents where all the girls were sleeping. And it, it was, it made her very nervous. And she said that every single night she was holding her rosary in a bat because she was scared that something was going to come into the tent. And once the girls had all gone home, I think she was, she had said that they stayed an extra day or two after that, just to get everything buttoned up after their stay. And they started hearing these really weird, growly, long drawn out calls that she had never heard before along a Creek that runs next to the property. And it, scared them all enough that they called out the Dubuque County deputies a few different times and they'd come out and say, you know, I think you guys should just all sleep in the lodge, you know, where there's a locked door in case it was a prowler. And they'd called them out like two or three times. And the last time they'd been called out, the guys had heard what they were talking about. And there was something ripping down big branches, which they found, which I think she was saying was like six inches in diameter. And the guy, the deputies headed off to try to figure out what or who this was. And they ended up turning around because they didn't want to run into it, which was disconcerting to say the least. But then that same woman, and she didn't even mention this one in her initial BFRO report, but a lot of times different stories will come out too when somebody starts feeling uncomfortable talking to you. And she had said later on that summer, and I should say at this point, she has no idea what Bigfoot is and had had never seen one something like this being called a Bigfoot until the PG film came out a couple of years later. But she was with her parents. Her dad was driving. Mom was in the front seat. She was in the back. She was in 18 or 19 at this time. And they were driving back from visiting her grandpa in what I think was Delhi, Iowa. And they're driving down the road and her dad slams on the brakes and says, what was that? And she looks up just in time and in their headlights, she sees this two-legged creature running across the road that she said looked like the color of an Irish setter. So it was like a a rich red color with a long stringy hair. And she said it it seemed almost like this the shape of a, a teenage boy, but it ran across the road in a very few steps, put its hand on a guardrail and swung itself down into a creek bed and then they couldn't see it anymore. And she they were very confused about what that was. And later on when the PG film came out and it was on TV, it confirmed to her that's what she saw and made her pretty suspicious of what she might have experienced at that Girl Scout camp. That is is probably my favorite report that mm-hmm. I've heard come out of Iowa. And because you're able to research it, it's one of the more recent 
out there ones. Oh man, I just love that. It's that is so cool. And that is Delhi is up by Dyersville, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's towards the Dubuque. Dyersville's up there. Cascades up there. But yeah, Dubuque's a fantastic area. It's one of my favorite ones to work, especially when the weather's a little bit better. But there's so much comes out of there. And just last April, I had gone notified of a, another report from a guy named Steve Moon, which some people be familiar with. He used to be a BFRO investigator and is in that Lowlands group. But he had a friend reach out to him and who had been mushroom hunting with his son in Dubuque. And as they were foraging around, they started having things thrown at them, like different rocks and sticks and like pine cones. And they started looking up, trying to figure out what was going on. And on one of the bluffs, they saw a large black thing leaning back and forth from behind a large boulder, which sounds a whole lot like a Bigfoot to me. And ever since I got that report, I've been working that area pretty diligently. I've had things thrown at me once up there, but it caught me so off guard. I really couldn't tell where it had come from. And then I had also, five, 10 minutes after that, heard that that really weird zipper sound that people hear about. And it sounded like somebody unzipped a backpack in the middle of the woods and there was no one else around there. Um, so that's really my only couple of experiences there, but it's a great area. I mean, where, where Iowa does get bears, they're in Dubuque. You know, I found mountain lion prints up there. It's right along the Mississippi. It's just ample food and area to hide and really move around from Illinois to the rest of Iowa up to Wisconsin. It's all really easily accessed, uh, which I think is why it makes it such a good spot. Do you feel, I'll give you two scenarios. Uh, Do you think there's, it's more of a migration type thing in Iowa or could we have some areas where, They're hanging out like a Southeast Oklahoma type deal. I don't think that they migrate. And I think that's an unpopular opinion when a lot of more educated big footers start talking about Iowa. I think it's the Southeast Oklahoma thing where they have a large radius that they typically operate in. I think you're talking about is the area X where they believe they tagged one. It had been seen moving up to 60 to 70 miles in any area. And I think that's exactly what's happening. And it's just trying to figure out from there and predict where they're going to be in what seasons. Like with the area I have really close to me, I have only ever gotten activity there during the winter months, December to February. I think they are very aware of where people are and what months they could know very well that there's so few people in that park when it's cold. Mm -hmm. So it's an okay area to move through, but when it warms up, they're going to retreat into a lot thicker areas or areas that, that really people just aren't going to, which could be up to Dubuque. I suspect that it might be a couple of different populations of Bigfoot, but it's really hard to know. But with Dubuque, there's so many areas that they could move through. But I think, I think the ones, especially down here where I am, could be moving maybe all the way up towards Backbone and and Volga. But it's hard to know, right? It's I just try to plot my own experiences and what months they happen along with credible witness reports to try to get an idea of where they might be so I can put myself in those areas during those times to try to give myself the, the best opportunity I can. When you're, let's say you're trying to figure out an area that would be good to potentially scout for looking for Bigfoot, are there main things that you look for in an area before you actually, you know, go boots on the ground somewhere? Yeah, I like to pull up Google Earth and get a feeling for topography of the area. I have always had my best luck around rivers. I think a lot of the Bigfoot in the Midwest probably are also eating the freshwater clams that we have Mm. in quite an abundance. So I usually look for rivers or moving water, thicker 
big areas of forested areas that are connected to other ones. And then I also try to look at where people have had their experiences in the past and make sure that you see a lot of deer. There's a handful of locations around me that look great, but the area where I get the most from has an overabundance of deer. Usually every time I go there, it's odd if I don't see 10 or 15 deer. And I think that's a a great food source that they're probably exploiting. In the areas that have deer, but I don't see them as much, I don't get near as much activity. So you want to look at game trails, figure out where the animals are moving, what kind of animals that they could be exploiting. It makes total sense that there'd have to be a super huge food source or an overabundance of uh, food, like you're saying, the Mm -hmm. deer there. We've talked a lot about the eastern part of the state. I'm just curious as a researcher, have you picked up anything recently from the western side of the state at all? Yeah, there was one I talked to either last fall or last summer. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it, it was in south southwestern Iowa, I think. And it was quite a while ago in the late 90s, but this gentleman who won, turned out to be an anthropologist um, when he went on to school and was a hunter, and he was hunting with his dog and uh, like through this area, it's like a natural prairie with trees and I think it was close to the Skunk River, but I could be mistaken. Um, But he had gone to the top of a little berm and had just stopped to get a a drink. And he noticed his dog pointing and growling towards this really high grass that butted up to a tree in a river. And he looked over there and he saw over the blue stem, which is six or seven foot tall grass, he saw the shoulders and head of this dark, furry, or hairy-looking animal walking. And he could start at the different areas where the the grass density changed. He could see how its legs moved and noted what an unusual gait that was for something, which I think is an important part of that story, given the fact that he was going to school for anthropology and would have been familiar with those things that's a that's a really good one i think from that area but the skunk river will pop up in a lot of historical reports and i think you're seeing that too with your own research and unfortunately i haven't spent as much time looking at western iowa just because it's a lot harder for me to get to when i have eastern iowa so close but there is there's really no no shortage of reports and a lot of those will run into Nebraska and, and Missouri which are all very close to that area too. Oh yeah, I agree with you. Definitely the Skunk River does come up in another one that's come up for me quite a bit and from even just reports taking it from festivals locally like the Van Meter Visitor Festival is the Raccoon River. There's a lot of sightings on different parts of the Raccoon River from over the years. So listeners who are familiar with Iowa, definitely keep that in mind if you're familiar with where the Raccoon River is in Iowa. It's good stuff. It's It all comes down to Pretty much like Robert W. Morgan said in his book, it's draw a hundred mile radius around where you're at, figure out where the best is so you don't have to drive too far and just becoming the best at what you do in your area, which you're definitely doing out in your part of the state. Yeah, I'm trying. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Let's talk about, let's talk about, I believe it was last August, right? Yep. Late August. Yeah. So for listeners, we'll get you up to speed. The last two years, I've gone out with Tate Hieronymus, who's a Bigfoot researcher. First year, and listeners are already aware of this, the first year Tate and I went out to this area in Iowa, and we had some interesting things happen. We had a tree get pushed over in front of our camp. We recorded tree knocks. I recorded a zipper noise at... 3 a.m. in the morning on the last night. And then 
this last summer, Tate's the one who's the organizer of the weekend and opened it up to some other people. So we had myself, Tate, Ontario was there. Ron Reed, another researcher was there as well. And both weekends you can see Tate has documentaries about in his Sasquatch, a search for Sabe series on his YouTube channel. But what were some things that you observed that, that weekend, Ontario? You know, it, it looks like just another really good Iowa spot. There's a lot of animal sign everywhere. And another thing that I really liked was there really weren't that many people there mm-hmm. when we were there, which is pretty ideal. So you know that you're not getting cross-contamination from other people. But it was it was a really fun weekend. I hadn't met a lot of you in person. I had I'd talked to a handful of you quite a bit online. So that was it was a blast just getting together and trying out different research techniques that everybody, some other people might use, like Tate would use versus things that I would use and just learning from each other. But I the one thing that sticks out to me even now was that that first night we really just focused on making a scene, drawing attention and towards the camp mm-hmm. with the laser show music. We were all just hanging out and laughing and by the fire. We did a little bit of night ops that first night, but that second night was the one that I know sticks out to you and me the most. <laughs> and I think if, if what we had <laughs> was what, what we're there for, I think it probably came in a lot closer because of all the activity we were having in camp the, the day before, just between all of us. That that still, that night, it just, it still it feels odd. like it was last, like just yesterday. It was, is that's the weirdest thing, Ontario. So many, I still kicking myself for not checking the batteries on my recorder, <laughs> which is like, it, it's just the thing luck. that you learn, right? Like yeah. I didn't get the whole night recorded because I didn't put fresh batteries in it and I would have had plenty of SD card space. That second night we went out for an extended kind of night expedition from what I remember. Was that the night we were split into groups or was that we were all together? I think we were, I w- mm, I'm not sure. I, we could have split up, but I think we were all all together and we just wanted to walk the road from camp, grab a road from camp and try to follow it to a path and kind of circle on back around to camp. And we we walked for a while and we'd stop and let off some whoops and some knocks. And I think we kicked up coyotes a handful of times, but didn't have a whole lot. But shoot, if I back up, I I had forgotten this part. Before we were, before we went out that night, Tate's friend Luke had come out and he Tate had recorded yes. a video yeah. of Luke singing, which he just has a fantastic voice and playing guitar. And we were just after that, we were all messing around and Luke hadn't really been out bigfooting before. And so we were just playing some recordings, what we do, what we're looking for. And we had played the Sierra sounds really loud out loud (laughs) yeah on a speaker and we all heard this really long drawn out howl pretty far from where we were but every i think everybody stopped in in their place and ran around trying to grab gear to get a recorder on or something and it was weird that's typically how it is it was too early for my long duration night recorder to kick on automatically and we just didn't think anything was going to happen yet. That's usually how those things go. And then I think after that, we headed out on that night ops pretty soon afterwards. And we had seen what we thought was possibly some eye glow, but it ended up being fireflies, if I Mm -hmm. remember right. And I think we were all just really just worn out from the heat towards the end of that night. And so after doing some whoops with no no response we headed back into camp and bunned up the night i think around maybe 11 30 or midnight Mm -hmm. which is early in for the yeah the grand scheme of things i was car camping and something i do whenever i go out at night and i usually typically have my windows rolled down with some sleeves to keep the bugs out and tate was car camping you and ron were in tents 
we all just got tucked into our respective sleeping areas yep. and tried to fall asleep. And I don't, I think maybe 40, 45 minutes after we had laid down, I, and I don't, I have never been uncomfortable sleeping in my car once when all the different times I've been out at night, fall right asleep. I usually stay asleep and sleep really well, but it was something was just off. And I was starting to, to drift off and I heard, like a car door close. Mm -hmm. And it's it's important to know that we're on a a dead end of a long gravel area. So there's no, no other cars around other than our vehicles there. And I hopped on my phone quick and sent you a text and Tate a text. And I think Ron and Ron was asleep, (laughs) but you and Tate were still up. And I said, did you guys just close your car door and you're said, Nope. And that you guys had heard that too, which is interesting because Bigfoot are known to mimic sounds, Mm. whether it's a zipper like you had heard in the year before or car doors are a really common one that they could just be lurking around and listening to all the sounds you're making in camp and try to mimic those out of curiosity. So I heard that and I was like, this is odd nobody had left their cars or their tents and i think i fell asleep very lightly so i was pretty on edge after that and woke up again around three ish and heard a car door again and then a bunch of it sounded like feet running around in the gravel on the roads and i was just on red alert after that i just laid there staring at the ceiling of my car i don't i want to look i don't want to look you know what what on earth was making these sounds and i also remember from that night the the coyotes were just insane things were kicking off the coyotes all around camp and i I remember waking up pretty early because i did not sleep much that night And I got out and went over to the fire and you were up pretty soon after that too. And I just looked over to you and I think we both pretty much said at the same time, what a weird freaking night that was. Because we were all hearing a lot of the same sounds, or at least you and I were. Exactly. And to to fill fill in a little bit from my side. So what I personally experienced was so i'm in a tent on the kind of outskirts of camp area and it was between the 3 to 3 30 a.m so i would i'd gone to sleep sleeping not so well because of what had had happened earlier and i I woke up to hearing uh two whoops way out in the woods. And I remember that the first thought I had was why is Ontario out in the woods doing whoops? Cause they sounded very similar to the whoops you had been doing earlier mm-hmm. when we, yeah, were which doing people can so, hear in that yeah. Tate's documentary too, if they're curious. Oh, what that's those true. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Unfortunately did not get those recorded because my recorder was out of batteries. I believe and correct me if I'm wrong, but also Ron had heard some things around that time of night too, right? He did the opposite side of camp from me Mm -hmm. down the long gravel that we had walked that night before. Because I want to say there was, it was like a long call was heard. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I think we all were just bamboozled that next morning. I remember even Tate said he heard that first car door shut and he was Mm -hmm. really confused about what that was as well. And I think that I touched on it earlier, but I think that mimicry is important because it's something that you guys experienced the year prior there. Oh, with absolutely. your tent zip outside your, yeah. yeah, outside your tent. It's just, it, it's, there's not a lot of people around where we were. It, it's just, it was a weird night. It's very unsettling. Still weirds me out when I think about it, but I definitely want to want to go back again someday. Maybe a little bit more prepared. Of course, every time you want to be better prepared. Do you think going through that weekend, how do you feel about that area for you think there's potentially some Bigfoot there or what was your I think there definitely the could be. Yeah. yeah, I think there definitely could be. I think you guys had gotten more action than we did. That last trip out there, I think we had to hit Knox too, which is pretty compelling. 
I personally haven't spent enough time there to really give a definitive answer, but I think they probably were there that night and at least that month but or the year before, which I think you guys went around the same time of the year, didn't you? It was very close. Yeah. It was like yeah. same time of summer, very hot. Yeah. Very similar. Which is important too, I think, because if an area doesn't change a lot, there's no reason why they wouldn't stay around there. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. It's just weird. The one thing Tate told me the first time was like, this is very not normal for us to get so much action. And then the second time Correct. get even, you know, I view it as crazier actually hearing vocals. I thought I would never hear mm-hmm. vocals and just, it's just it's an some eye-opening experience stuff. when it happens the first time. Some weird stuff for sure. But it definitely, you know, it, that whole experience, you know, wasn't a visual, but it was enough that now in my mind, there's no doubt that it's the whole thing is actually real. I would say right. prior to that, I was like 99%, right? Uh, yeah, well, I think we're all that yeah, way. You exactly. know, even the people that are spend so much time doing this and are so firm in their beliefs, we still waver from time to time. And those experiences, especially when they're a little bit more common at night, mm-hmm. are important to to shore that up. Yeah. And there's times I still I find myself wavering, but then something happens and I'm, you know, oh, I always think that they're real. I always believe that they're there. But sometimes it's hard to be like, why would they be here where I am? Why, why of all the places would we overlap and things happen and it just shores up that you have an idea of what these things are doing and, and where they're at and it helps push you forward until the next time or until the time you eventually have a, a visual. Oh, yeah. It, to me, it makes sense that they would be there. It just does. When If you think big picture but it is weird Mm -hmm. if you're just thinking about like Iowa and you don't know all the, you're not, if you're not a Iowa Bigfoot nerd, but if you are, you you get it, but. Yeah. um, We live and die by it. (laughs) Proving why they'd be here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's a, it's fun. Hopefully next big goal is if there's ever another Iowa BFRO outing, would love to check that out. Maybe in the next few years, if it ever happens again, but man, it's, It is really fun when you're actually able to go out and look for stuff in your home state. But Ontario, I'm so glad that I was able to finally have you on and be able to talk about Bigfoot. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. If people would like to reach out to you about Bigfoot things, if they had any questions, is there a way they can keep up to date, follow you online, stuff like that? Yeah, the spot's probably Instagram with the handle of Midwest Bigfoot. Once you click on that, you'll see Ontario the Midwest Bigfoot pop up. And that's definitely where I am most active in posting things. I have a Twitter that you could definitely use as well, although I'm a little bit slower to upload there, which is my own fault. So probably those two would be the best places to to get a hold of me if they have any questions or any experiences in Iowa you might want to talk about. That's awesome. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, if you've never been able to talk to Ontario, if you ever get a chance to meet her at a conference or something, please make sure you do. She is a great researcher. Highly recommend being able to chat with her. But thank you so much for coming on, Ontario. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to you, all my listeners, for listening to the podcast. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's a list. Bush pilots in Alaska that have seen something from their plane. Retired law enforcement officers whose department had a large file for Bigfoot encounters. Individuals that have had Bigfoot encounters on their family property through multiple years and generations. Individuals who've had a face-to-face encounter in the state of Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, West Virginia, Alabama, or Mississippi. 
individuals who've had a face-to-face encounter in the state of Oklahoma or Arkansas in the Washita National Forest. Individuals who've had a face-to-face encounter on Prince of Wales Island or surrounding area in southeast Alaska. Any encounter in Franklin County, Texas. Hunters that have never shared what they saw in the woods due to fear of ridicule. Individuals that have had a Bigfoot tried to enter your house in the Honabi, Oklahoma area. Any encounters that happened within a 20-mile radius of Northfield, Massachusetts and 25-mile radius of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Encounters in the Enchanted Circle. Encounters in the Yosemite National Park area or any national park for that matter. Individuals that have lived a long life don't care what people think about them now and want to share what happened to them 50 to 60 years ago. I'm your guy to share your story. Individuals that live in remote wooded property and feel like they're under attack by Bigfoot after clearing their land. And lastly, any Bigfoot encounters where the individual saw what seemed to be an orangutan. Please reach out to me at BigfootSociety at gmail.com if any of those fit what you've experienced. And for those where it doesn't fit, please feel free to reach out anyways. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it. I'll see you back next time, listeners. New shows on Mondays and Fridays. I'll see you then.